Thank you. So uh, we're going to try something uh, a little risky. Uh, my demo, because the device will talk to each other, is basically based on Wi-Fi. So hopefully Wi-Fi will work. And if you want to participate on the demo, which means have your device talk to other people's device, there will be this link on the top, on the right, or sometimes on the bottom, eldogwin.name slash messages at IPK. So if you have an Android phone, you can download this. It's a simple messaging app, sorry, that will basically just send message and auto-discover everybody that has installed this app. So you will need to trust me to download this app if you don't, I understand it perfectly. Uh, I'll try to do a demo. It's uh, based on, uh, well, a lot of things I'm going to explain. So don't hesitate to, to download this. So let's your device talk to each other. First, this is me. Uh, I work at Catchbase. Anybody knows Catchbase? Please raise your hand if you know Catchbase. A few of you. Not enough. You guys know MongoDB, the document database. Cashbase is also a document database and a key value store. So it's a NoSQL database. Uh, there's my uh, Twitter account, my email address. Don't hesitate to. Uh, I'm going to stop doing this and stop talking with my hand. Don't hesitate to reach out to me if you want to. Uh, and let's jump to uh, the broad topic of today, which is the Internet of Things. Has anybody seen this before? This, to me, is the ancestor of all the things. This is a uh, toaster running uh, NetBSD, one of the first you know, usual device, usual object that you have at home that is connected. So one guy decided to run NetBSD on his toaster. It works. It can actually control all the uh, toasting mechanism through NetBSD. I think that's uh, quite interesting. If you want to see more interesting examples like this, there's what this website called the Internet of Useless Things. I invited you to check it out. It's great. Um, so that was the, uh, the fun part. Now, the Internet of Things, what it is, it's a lot of connected object basically generates a lot of data about what you're doing. You know, there's this uh, quantify yourself move movement, like you have this um, bracelet that gets metrics about all the things you're doing all day. And it sends it back to a server somewhere, a central server. And if you want to get the data back, you can't. You have to use their API. It's a bit painful. It's basically, it's not your data anymore, which, you know, from a privacy perspective, it's not so good. Um, so basically, the point is what we call Internet of Things now, all these things of the Internet are connected to a central server. That's mostly how it is now. You have some new things uh, coming up from Nest and a lot of uh, you know, ba vaguely decentralized objects. And this part is called machine to machine, which you might have heard before uh, people talked about embedded uh, or real-time devices. That was like 20 years ago in the industry. Uh, and now it's uh, mostly M2M, machine to machine. So, what does it actually mean? How do you define M2 machine to machine M2Ms? Basically, you have devices talking to each other without using a central server, central piece. So, basically, without the internet. So, if, you know, the internet of things, all these things of the internet, when you don't have the internet, you can do machine to machine communication. And that's great because it's fully decentralized and gives you control over your data, which is, again, something extremely important from a privacy perspective. So it's pretty common in the industrial world. As I said before, it was, uh, used to be called embedded or real-time devices. You have uh, a lot of uh, stuff to get metrics. For instance, in a, um, in a factory, you get the metrics. You know what's going on. You get alerts on the metrics. And it, it doesn't really rely on the internet. It's just a local network gets all the stuff store centrally and that you can you know look it up and see what's going on and you know adapt. And and you know that's nice, but the question has how does it actually works when you don't have this you know central server. Uh, machine to machine, talking about uh, uh, peer to peer discovery, it's really about peer to peer. Uh, you probably have heard of Emule or Casa or Napster at the beginning like Napster was really the first software that got peer to peer out. And the thing is Napster isn't really completely peer-to-peer. -peer. It used to be based on you know big server in the middle that would help you discover other people. And once you've discovered all these other people, then you can connect directly and get stuff. That's still a bit centralized. So there's uh, different, thing, different ways to do pure peer-to-peer -peer without that central part. Um, one of them is you give me your IP address. I will enter your IP address on my, on my app, and then I will be able to connect. That's a bit painful, obviously. Uh, if you're using phone, you can make it easier by generating a QR code that will contain your IP address, maybe credentials that are just 
um, usable for a one one shot uh, synchronization. So that that works too. We have an app called PhotoDrop. There's I will send you the link after that. There's a, a blog about it, uh, which is nice, but still requires uh, human interaction. And if you think about it, most of the objects we will have in home connected uh, that gather data about you or what you're doing, they will be basically connected to your home Wi-Fi network. And there's uh, many different things you can do to discover other connected pieces on your Wi-Fi network, and there's a bunch of, the, of them already here. You probably have heard of Bonjour, which used to be called Rendezvous, which is extremely French, uh, and based on uh, ZeroConf. Uh, it's basically uh, based on what we call MDNS, or DNS Service Discovery. So the, the very smart people that did the DNS stuff years and years and years ago, before even talking about Internet of Things and all this stuff, um, they decided to implement some uh, like a service registry, and you can basically uh, ask every ser DNS service registry if there's an existing service that you can connect to. That's what Avai, uh, Android Network Service Discovery, Bonjour, JMDNS, which is the one I'm using here, uh, are based on. And then you have this new cool thing, well, not so new, called UPnP, Universal Plug and Play, which is a um, protocol used by uh, all your uh, major set-top boxes or uh, console like the PlayStation 3 or Xbox, or all these things. They basically use DLNA, which is a layer on top of UPnP to discover all the cool stuff that can give you content. Like if you have a home media server, it will use UPnP to advertise itself as the Xbox. Say, hey, I'm a media server. You can read some stuff out of my um, uh, server. Please do. So uh, that's how it works. That's how you discover people. And that's what I'm going to show you uh, today. I'm going to show you a bit of code about how it works. But first, the question you might be asking yourself, uh, what's a cache-based guy doing here? I mean, I'm a NoSQL database person. I've been talking about decentralizing stuff. We talk about devices. Not really talking about NoSQL so far. Uh, there's a very good reason for that. Uh, we have an app called Cache-Based Mobile, and that's the problem we're trying to fix. No bars, what would be the problem? No bars has no reception you know, when you don't have network. And to fix this problem, we, we've built, uh, well, let me talk a bit more about the problem. Uh, we've, we've built an embedded database, so that's the magical life of being always connected to the cloud, which we all know never happens. There's always one time when you don't have network. So basically, when you don't have network, or a little bit of network, it's extremely slow, your app doesn't work, you get an error. As a user, you're extremely pissed off, you pull, put in bad note to uh, the guy that you know, made this, this app, and then you install another app. That's the reason why people would uninstall app. Um, freezing, crashing, makes sense, you know, doesn't work, put it out, and then 60% it's slow responsiveness. Slow responsiveness also comes from having a bad network reception. And so that's a problem we, we've tried to fix with Cache-Based Mobile, which is data location. And the answer we want to give to people is have local data with a local database and sync automatically to something else. That something else could be a central server or it could be another phone or another, any other instance of that embedded database, which is pretty much why I'm here today. So once you have your local database running on your device, data always there. Even if you have a poor or no connection, you still have you know, data. So from a UX perspective, it is pretty good. Um, we've taken care of all the nasty stuff you have to do for you. So basically, to do a sync, you just declare the URL of the, the thing you want to sync and decide if it's push or pull synchronization. I will show you the code later on. Uh, so quickly, what is Cache-Based Mobile? Two things, Cache-Based Lite, this embedded database I've been t talking to you about, and this thing called Sync Gateway, which is sort of an app server that runs between your local mobile app and the cache server, which we won't really need for today because we don't want to sync on anything central. So quick words about uh, Cache-Based Lite. As I said, it's uh, embedded. It runs in-app. It's pretty small. So for Android, it's probably about 500K. Um, and it has uh, several interesting characteristics for a mobile database. It's a document database, so it's purely JSON. There is no uh, tables or column. If you've, if you've used uh, SQLite, you know that it's a bit painful to do SQL again on mobile. You know, everybody uses JSON anyway, so it's kind of an old thing. 
uh, as it's a database, you can create index, you can query those index, so you can actually run query on the local database, which you know is normal if you have like something like SQLite, which is a SQL database, you can expect it to work. It also works with a JSON database. It's even based, this is very important, it means that you can do stuff asynchronously and you can be one when there's new stuff, which basically means you can do real-time updates of your app. So when you set up a synchronization to something, you open a WebSocket if you want to, it's a bit battery draining, but you can, and it will just get you all the new stuff, update the index automatically, and then update the screen automatically, which is also what I'm going to show you about. And then it syncs. That's the uh, bottom right part. There's the sync gate where this app server I told you about. Uh, quickly, on the top, iOS on the back, Android, how do you get an instance of database? Basically, you have a manager, give me a database, do a map of string and object, because basically a JSON object is just a map of string and stuff and then store it as a JSON document. All right. Uh, I'll be extremely quick also on the sync gateway part of things. Uh, this app server runs uh, all the synchronization parts. So if you have apps running on everybody's phone and synchronizing data from the cloud, there's something you might need, like security, a user, um, uh, granularity, because you don't want to get the data of all the other users, again, from a privacy perspective, that wouldn't really work. Uh, you don't want to sync all the data from the SQL database to your mobile database, because you know, it's just not the same size, so you don't want to do it. And basically, the sync gateway allows you to deal with all this stuff. This is an extremely fancy animation to show you that it actually syncs. Uh, how do you handle these things? There's six functions to know. There's uh, a JavaScript function that's run on the sync gateway. And it works with six methods, JavaScript methods, require user, require access, require role, and channel access and role. With those six methods, you can tag a document to a channel, which basically is how you orchestrate data. If you have an app for news, you can say this user subscribe to this channel. This channel only has documents that uh, are news about economy or about sport or about whatever you like. So that's the channel part. That's what allows you to you know, move stuff around. Uh, you can add security and permission on this channel based on role, permission, group, call it whatever you want. It's just, again, a tag based on the user that gives him access to more data. That was the uh, catch, catch, mobile, oh, oh, catch base mobile speech, sorry. And that's the important bit for today. This thing is optional, and it's called Catch Base Light Listener. If you want to do peer-to-peer, -peer, basically, you want people to connect to your computer. What that means is you have to run a server on to, to your device. You have to run a server on your device. So this embedded database that I just talked to you about, you can add Catch Base Light Listener. It's a server that will expose or make your database look like a sync gateway to any other embedded database, which means that if you have my IP from your app, you can sync your database to my database thanks to this nifty little thing called Cache Based Light Listener. So it's really just an HTTP server. Don't have to have it. You can just use Cache Based Mobile as an embedded database just to store JSON. Then you can sync it to the cloud through the sync gateway or sync it to someone else's phone. <coughs> How it works is you set up replication links, so you can push data out of your phone to somewhere else, or pull data from somewhere else to your phone. All right, so um, if you want the code of what I'm going to show you, it's there, it will be on the slides, you can download it. This is an, exam an example of uh, PhotoDrop, which is uh, an app we've built to share photos when you don't have the internet. That is the thing, like you're on a festival, you're taking photos, you're taking pictures, there's no network, or it poorly works, never works. You can never share a photo. You're standing just right next to me, and we can share photos because the internet doesn't work. If you install a um, photo drop, basically, you, you start a Wi Fi hotspot with your phone, then your friend connects to your phone. What it's going to do is generate a QR code. The QR code will give my friend my IP address, some credentials. He reads the QR code, he has everything he needs to connect to my database, and then we can exchange data. So it's to exchange photos. Uh, time for the uh, dreaded demo. I'm going to run a Java app, and I'm going to run an Android app. And hopefully, you'll be able to see. 
if phaser works. And it doesn't, obviously, because it's the demo effect. Oh, wow. So I just run this. All right. I'm connected on the Wi-Fi already. So I, th the good thing is I don't have to, to show my phone, because some of you are already connected. I haven't written anything like this. And some people have actually written some fancy, fancy, fancy words over there. So that, that means that someone downloaded the app, didn't do anything, was on the same network than I was, and started putting up message over there. So whoever did this, could you please keep on doing it? Hi, mom. Can you, can you do a high webcam Zagreb for us? It'd be great. In the meantime, I'm going to show you the actual code, like how it works, how it actually works. I'm going to show you the Java code, because my Android code is like, I'm keeping. Uh, because my Android code is, uh, let's say, not the best code ever. OK. So, domain object, I'm basically sending message. A message is based out of uh, uh, just a basic string and a date to be able to store all this message uh, and to sort this message from the newest to the oldest. Um, so, that's how you create a document. And this important part here is how you would query a document a JSON uh, document in a JSON database. Have any one of you have heard of CouchDB before? Some of you, good, good. Uh, if you know CouchDB, you know there's this thing called views, basically allow you to build an index based on the content of your JSON file, which is what I'm doing here. Basically saying each time the document is of type message, I will create a new index with the date and the value as, doc uh, as uh, and the document as the value. That's an index of all the messages sorted by date, which is how I'm um, basically showing you all this stuff. That's just a dummy uh, message database, uh, singleton factory to get your database. And this is the, the big controller. And the important thing about the controller is um, might have seen that this is, hey, hi, welcome, Zagreb, thank you. This is updated automatically. I haven't done anything. I'm not reloading anything. The reason for that is that I've implemented a changes node that is based on the index you've seen. And basically, as I told you before, it's an event-based database. So each time you get a new event, I can upload the, uh, update the index, sorry, and then re-render my view and then get this real-time thing going on, which is insanely great. Now, how does this work from a, a synchronization perspective? I have this new configuration object that uses JMDNS, which basically is DNS discovery. Here you can see that I'm starting a new server, because if we're doing peer-to-peer -peer sync, I need to be a server, so you, get to, you guys can connect to my uh, app. That's the code you have here. It's pretty simple, you know, just four lines of code. And then when you run JMDNS, this discovery thing, you need to create what is called a discovery listener, which basically implements uh, what do you do when, you have, when you've discovered a new service, or how do you expose a new service? And what do I do when I've discovered a new service is get the URL of the service, which is basically your URL, the IP of the device that's exposing the service, and the name of the database. So it's an URL. And once I have this URL, that's all the code you need to do that replication that I told you before. That's just those. like, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven line of code. The URL could be the URL of the SYN gateway, you know, the NoSQL server I told you about. Or it could be an URL of any device that's standing on the same network that I have. And once you do this, that's it. Your database syncs with someone else's database. And that's very few code. If you ever tried to do that yourself, well, you probably see what I mean. So. If you want to know more, we have, so you can ask questions on our forums. We have something called a mini hack. It's a 30 minute uh, tutorial on Couchbase Mobile. There is no peer to peer in there. Do you have any questions? Thank you. We have five minutes for questions. 
I'll try not to hit this thing again and keep my in my back. No question? Don't miss a question over there. Questions? No, no, no. Okay, I have a question. Right. So um, if you have uh, stuff just being auto-discovered and passing messages along, how do you do any kind of security in terms of like making sure people aren't impersonating? So this chat has no who sent the message. Yes. But yes. if it had, like he was sending messages. How would you do it? So I, I could probably get that code or even like figure out from like decompiler code and figure out how you're doing the auto-discovery write my own program. It's on that, GitHub, you can do it. You can yeah, see so it. I, I, could, I could do the auto-discovery and then send right. my stuff, like not even run your app. How do you, how do, you, how do, you do like the, uh, the identity part of stuff in auto-discovery? So you don't do this in the discovery part. The discovery part is the DNS thing. Everybody knows, can access to the DNS registry, right? It's, it's there, all right. Security is handled when you set up replication between your database and someone else's database. I wanted to make everything automatic, so I have no security at all. If you want to put security, you, to, you have a pull or a push replication. This replication can be uh, authenticated, basically. So if I do a set, I don't know, uh, authenticator, I can create a new authenticator object, which is basically a username and a password. How do you uh, actually configure that username and password from the receiving hand? Um, that is somewhere around the configuration bits that you've seen here. This uh, thing called Light Listener, which is the server that's running. You can actually set, or should be able to set, something which is not here which is awkward. All right, database object, sorry. There's this method called set validation that basically allows you to you know, set, set up credential to make sure that n not everybody can connect to your database. Everything is encrypted or can be encrypted. Um, the links are SSL encrypted. And then if you want to encrypt stuff on your disk, we don't have anything out of the box right now, so you would have to store everything encrypted already. You know, that's possible. That's just a little more work for you. It's, it's important when you talk about security for like, stuff like banking. You know, if you, if you have your app and some sensitive information and someone stole your phone and all the data is not encrypted, then you know, that's, that's not good. So you have to do it yourself for now. With Sunderbolt Map, we would have automatic encryption of your local data. Well, do we have more questions? Thanks, by the way. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is, um, what about the small em embedded de devices, devices like Raspberry Pi, uh, Arduino, BeagleBone, and okay. et cetera? And is it possible to do that magic <laughs> over the, some kind of Bluetooth ne network, or it uh, has to be uh, connected to the internet? So um, about the uh, hardware side of things, the app I run on my Mac was a, a Java app. So if you have a, something that runs a JVM, it works. The JVM runs on Raspberry Pi, it runs on Edisa, it runs on many small stuff. It's not extremely big in, size, in terms of memory. You know, there's a bit of, a, there's a, obviously some Java libraries like Jackson to do all the JSON mapping. That, that is pretty, that's probably the heaviest part because Jackson is really big from a library size perspective. Uh, I said the core is about two megs. I, I run it on a Raspberry Pi uh, with some friends from the Eclipse Foundation. The Eclipse Foundation does great stuff on the IoT space and M2M space. So about two and a half meg from a, a, a size perspective. And it runs on everything that runs a JVM. Now about the uh, network connection. If you don't have any network connection, if you lose the network connection, everything is handled transparently by Couchbase, which is, again, less code for you to write. So all you do is set up that replication start or stop, you can implement a service that actually starts a replication every five seconds, 10 minutes, whatever you want. And that's all you need to care about, really, because we're handling all the other you know, problems that you could have when you don't have network. Now, that being said, if you don't have any network, but you keep on writing stuff, and someone else keeps on writing stuff too, the same stuff, or basically you have a conflict, right? So you have two branches, your local branches, 
someone else's branch, you go back on the network and you figure out his branch is like far ahead, like five or six commits ahead, and you are still like two or three commits behind. Your own commit is on commit. You need to you know, do something, fix that conflict, because if you're going offline and then online, that will happen. And we have everything needed to basically end all those conflicts. So by default, the uh, automatic way of doing things is not looking at what's in the documents. We take the longest branch and we say, OK, that's, that's the, the longest one is the good one. That's probably not what you want to do from a business perspective. And there is no automatic way to handle conflicts for you because we don't know what your business is. So as I said before, it's an event-based database. So you can actually add a listener on the conflict. And once you listen to a conflict, you have the two conflicted revision. And now you decide what to do. If there is a last modification date filled on the document, then you can decide that the most recent date is the good one. If you want to show a screen with the two revision, that works too. Yes. Uh, I have a question about uh, the replication. So it uses auto discovery on a local, local network. Could it use auto discovery on a global network? What, what, uh, when you say global network, you mean the internet? Something like that. Yes. Uh, but mainly, what are the restrictions uh, around the network param parameters? So if I have uh, client isolation on my wireless network, could I use it? So, and so basically, you have two HTTP server, or just one, that allows people to connect to it. So it's just HTTP. The, the biggest question is, uh, as long as you can, you know, from your client, go to the server, it works. The biggest question is, how do you discover other people from a pure peer-to-peer -peer experience? This is using uh, DNS discovery. So I'm doing multicast, UDP multicast, or UDP broadcasting. Basically, I'm sending one bit to every possible device on the network which is something you can do on a local network because it's not going to be too expensive. If you try to do it on the internet, every router will tell you, go away, I'm not doing broadcasting for you because you're going to blow the internet. This is, it's like sending gigs and gigs of data on the internet. It's bloated enough already, so just don't do it. And then if you want to have some sort of global uh, thing for discovery, basically you have this piece in the middle that allows you to discover more peer. Or you can go from, there's one peer that has a list of other peer, and then you connect to this guy, and give you the address of the other guy, and you connect to the other guy, and get the address of the other guy, and you know, can do some uh, ring thing. But you need some nodes, some IP to kickstart the process. So it's usually a central server, you actually have for torrent tracker, or like it was the case for Napster, and Kaza, and Emule, and all these things.